Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg, Juggler66, Hour of the Truth. Today, once again, in collaboration with my brother in Christ from the United States of America, Tom Fress from Inquisition Update, we are gathered here together to do the 81st study of what started to be uh, the discussion and studying of a book by Steve Wahlberg, End Time Delusions. And uh, when we came to the last section of that, that is uh, Exploding the Israel Deception, we decided to go to the original book that he wrote on his own um, also a few years ago called Exploding the Israel Deception and really go into a deep study of that. Now for the moment, we, um, yeah, we, we didn't actually leave the subject, but we are just going to show you, because this for Tom and for me is very important to show you, uh, that many, many of the reformers that we know, and probably also many that we don't know, but we can only speak about the ones we know or the ones we learn about, always accepted in biblical teaching and historic and historicist teaching that the papacy is the Antichrist that the first beast of Revelation chapter 13 is Rome and that the second beast of uh, chapter 13 in Revelation is Rome too. But speaking of pagan Rome with the first beast and paper Rome of the other, and there are a few examples of the reformers that we will go through this list, which is by the way also found on other places on the internet, not only on the site uh, that I took that from, just for the people who say, oh, you uh, are using here um, a paper from a Seventh Day Remnant uh, organization? Yeah, that's true. I did, uh, as I did in the past. Uh, sometimes when they tell the truth, I use their stuff. But um, I, during my research, I found two or three other web pages uh, that also carry the same table that we are going through in this video. And uh, therefore, it is not exclusively from that website, but I just took it from there. Anyway, the point is that we are going to put an emphasis on the study point that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist of scripture, prophecy, and history. That is so important to understand that. And it is not only my word or Tom's word or the word of the guy from whom we have this tablet or whatever, who, whoever, or even Steve Wahlberg or whatsoever. It is the word of of all the Protestants, some of, you, some of them you maybe know, some of them you maybe didn't. We were working through the Protestants before the Reformational time, like uh, Savonarola, like um, uh, Wycliffe and a few others. Now, today, we are going into the Reformers during the Reformation. And after that, we are going into the Reformers even after Reformational times and their views on Revelation 13, 17, and 18. That's what this is all about. But before we go into the next part of the study, let me warmly welcome my brother Tom Fress from the United States of America from Inquisition Update. Hello, Tom. Uh, hello, Yerk. It's my pleasure, privilege, and blessing to be here. I was a little bit late turning my, <laughs> my microphone on. I uh, got a little sniffle, so I've been uh, shutting my mic off. You'll have to remind me to turn it back on once in a while if I happen to forget. But uh, uh, in addition to your comments, I just want to reiterate, I know I do that a lot, but I want to reiterate that what we're doing, it, it, for the listeners need to understand that what we're doing in reading this table is to show that the historicist interpretation was the ancient, old, and only school of Bible prophecy interpretation that was ever known in the body of Christ. They understood things in a historical context. They knew that the 70th week of Daniel was fulfilled historically as recorded in the best history book we have in our possession. That is the Bible. The New Testament is the historical record of the complete and perfect fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel, that seven-year period of time when Messiah the Prince confirms the covenant in his blood and after three and a half years causes the sacrifices and oblations to cease by giving up his own life, a ransom for many. And then 
uh, three and a half years later through the spirit-filled apostles, that covenant was still confirmed to Jerusalem and the Jews until the end of that three and a half year period when the Jews officially and finally for the last time rejected the covenant in Christ's blood and stoned the witness that came to give them their last hearing, Stephen the prophet. And from then, the 490 year prophecy, the, 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 the 70 weeks of time were officially ended. And then the gospel went to the Gentiles. The gospel was to be preached. The covenant in Christ's blood was to be preached first to the Jews and to Jerusalem. And until the end of that 490th year, the end of that 70th week of that Daniel's prophecy, then and only then was the gospel to go to the Gentile world. And that's what is recorded in the New Testament. That's the very purpose one of the very purposes of the New Testament is to officially record everything that took place during that 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy. And there you have it. You can't add to it. You can't take away from it. But now that's the historicist interpretation of Bible prophecy. What is believed in the churches today is not historicist. They don't believe the 70th week of Daniel is fulfilled. They reject that the New Testament is the historical record of that 70th and final week, and thereby they even deny that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. You see what I mean? They believe the 70th week of Daniel is to be fulfilled in the future. And that's the same as saying Messiah has not yet come. That's exactly what it means. And that's why Yerk and I spend so much time denouncing this futurist delusion that has, that has become the orthodox teaching in all the apostate churches. And, uh, you know, if, if people hear the tenor of my voice rise and, and, and the passion come up in my voice, it's because this is, a most, this is the most serious subject a, a, a human being can talk about today. What I'm, what I'm talking about is universal apostasy. What I'm talking about is a universal rejection that Jesus is the Christ. That's what futurism does. It shifts the future, it shifts the 70th week of Daniel, which was fulfilled by Messiah the Prince, way off into the distant future. And it's the same as saying Messiah has not yet come. Yes, I know the churches all say that Jesus is the Christ, but then they turn right around and contradict themselves when they say the 70th week of Daniel is future. And not only do they say that the 70th week of Daniel is future, they say that the Antichrist will fulfill it. And guess how, what has to occur for this future phony 70th week of Daniel to be fulfilled? First, there has to be a nation state of Israel. That took place in 1948, okay? In the United Nations, by the way, not God, the United Nations declared the, 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 the creation of the, of, of, of the nation state of Israel, not God. It was not an act of God. It was an act of the papacy and together with the kings of the earth, and it was couched as a UN action, okay? to take the onus away from the papacy. All right, now what needs to happen is Jews living in the land. How do you get the Jews to go to their ancient homeland and live when God kicked them out? Well, you persecute them beyond their ability to tolerate. And that took place in World War I and World War II. That's what World War I and World War II were all about, to create a homeland for the Jews so that the papacy and his and the serpent, which gave him his seat and power and great authority, could fulfill a future fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel to a deluded world. Now, First World War and Second World War have taken place. The Jews are desperate to find peace in their own land where they can determine their own destiny. So they go down conveniently for the Pope and all the kings of the earth. They conveniently go down to Israel. 
All right. Now there's talk. You know, the, the so-called Antichrist is supposed to cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. Well, what does that mean? First of all, there has to be a temple and there has to be the reinstitution of animal sacrifices. When Daniel's prophecy says flat out, Messiah, the prince, will cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. And he did so when he gave up his own life and became the sacrifice to end all sacrifices. The only sacrifice that can take away sin that took away sin for all men for all time. And anyone who makes a sacrifice now after the fact eats and drinks damnation to himself. And that's exactly what the papacy and the kings of the earth want every Jew to do, to eat and drink damnation to themselves. If they couldn't kill them all in World War I, they couldn't kill them all in World War II, then let's kill them spiritually by making them return to animal sacrifices. When it's exactly why God used the seventh, the Roman Seventh Legion to destroy that temple in the first place, so that having rejected Christ, they wouldn't return to animal sacrifices and thereby eat and drink damnation to themselves. It was an act of mercy that God used the Roman Tenth Legion to destroy that temple and not leave one stone left upon another. It was an act of mercy. I want the listeners to understand. It was an act of love and mercy that God destroyed that temple. So why in the world does all of Christianity want a temple built on Temple Mount in Jerusalem so the Jews can eat and drink damnation to themselves? This I've just described to you just how apostate the Christian world is. There's nothing positive to learn from the churches today. They are totally corrupt. Now, we're talking about the historical belief of Christians all the way back to the first century Christians under Paul's ministry. We're talking about all the saints all the way back to Christ. What did they believe? And they believed exactly what you would expect, that Jesus is the Christ, and that that which replaces the Caesars would be the Antichrist. It was the Caesars who were withholding the rise of the man of sin, the son of perdition. And when they were taken out of the way, then the man of sin would be revealed. And all of that had to occur before Christ returns. And that's exactly the way it happened in history. And we know from the testimony of these people that have been registered in this, this, this chart that we've, that we've given you, gives you visible and researchable proof that futurism was never known in their generations. They always believed in the historicist interpretation of Bible prophecy. They all believed that Daniel's 70th week was fulfilled by Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. They had never even heard of futurism. And to teach futurism in their ears would be an abomination to them. But we're trying to show you that historicism is the only interpretation of Bible prophecy that was ever believed among the saints throughout the entire Christian era up until the, about the first few years of, of the 1800s when futurism began to be preached in the seminaries. It's not just Yerk and Tom that believe in historicism. It's all the saints throughout history. And this is the proof that we're offering you so that there's no doubt. Back to you, Yerk. Sorry for such a long introduction. But... Oh, that, that's okay. I also have to check if I switched on my mic because last time, you know, <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> and I had to cut three minutes of the Skype backup recording in there. No, I thank you very much for your inauguration uh, and explanation of this, Tom. Uh, and I think I want to ask you even to go a little bit deeper um, with the following. I think that most people have a problem in understanding that the papacy, the office of the papacy is the Antichrist. 
and every man throughout history that sat in that office as the Pope, as the Vicar of Christ, is the Antichrist. You know, in the beginning, when we were speaking of Steve Wahlberg's book, End Time Delusions, we were speaking about this Left Behind series, and we showed many of these books. And in all those teachings, and because of the refulfillment, futuristic refulfillment of Daniel's 70th week, the world teaches a three and a half year reign of Antichrist and a one man Antichrist. And I think many people just have problems with the concept that it is not one man, but that it is many men during the 1260 day year reign that was prophesied in the Bible. No man lives for 1260 years or longer. Uh, the longest man ever lived, I think, was Methuselah, some 969 years or something. Um, so no man ever lived that far. And I think most people have a problem with the concept of the office of the papacy being the Antichrist, and with that every man ever to sit on that chair, being the one who exalts himself above God, who... Um, uh, is the fulfillment of what Paul preached in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, yeah? um, that, he, um, uh, that he sitting in the body of, in, in the body of God and, and proclaiming to be God and all that stuff. And I think that people just have a problem with that concept. And I think it is a, an opportune moment for you, Tom, to go a little bit deeper into that subject and to tell the people that it is the office of the papacy and not just one man as so famously taught, of course, in the Left Behind series and in uh, Futurism. Yes, the lie has been repeated so many times it becomes the orthodox teaching. And uh, it's difficult to return people to the, to the truth because the lie has been repeated so many times. The Antichrist is not one single individual, okay? That's just part and parcel of the futurist lie. What we're really talking about is the man of sin who was revealed almost 1,500 years ago at, at, at what is believed to be the fall of the, the Roman Empire, which literally was no fall at all. It just morphed from the pagan Roman Empire to the quote-unquote holy Roman Empire under the Caesar now called the Pope. Okay, it was just a window dressing. And uh, the man of sin is not one individual. It's a succession of popes. Remember the Bible even talks about uh, the Pharisees who say they sit in Moses' seat. They believe themselves to be the successor of Moses. And that's exactly what the papacy does. The papacy is a succession of men, one right after the other, all throughout the Christian era, that are successors of one another. Okay, as it's the office that never changes. But a man only lives 70 years, three score and 10. And so you can't have the Antichrist who persecutes the saints, deceives the whole world, uh, uh, you know, wears out the saints of the Most High, changes God's times and laws, does all these things just in the lifespan of a single man. This is where Christians don't even use common sense. Okay, we have to be talking about an entity that has to be, exist long enough to commit all these things, to fulfill all these prophecies, and it cannot be done in one year, one lifetime. Okay, and 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 we're confirming this by reading this this chart that we have. They all believe the papacy was the Antichrist. Now they didn't mention one pope's name over another which is what is taught today. Even some people that, that, that believe the Pope is the Antichrist, well, they think it's a single Pope that's coming in the future, okay? Even the Roman Catholic Church would have you believe that the Antichrist may be a Pope, an apostate Pope that leads the whole church, that is the Roman Catholic Church, astray. And some Roman Catholics even believe it's the current Pope, Benedict, or uh, rather, uh, Francis the first. They are totally deluded. Of course, no Roman Catholic wants to believe that every pope from the first pope 
and every pope in succession until the last pope is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. No Roman Catholic is going to accept the fact that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. That every pope in succession from the first to the last was the Antichrist of his day, was the Antichrist of his day, the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist of his day. And that the office of Antichrist was simply uh, occupied by a successor when the previous one died. That's the truth. And that's what all these people that we're talking about, that's what they believed. They didn't see the Antichrist as just one single pope. They didn't see the Antichrist as just one single individual, pope or no pope. They knew that it was the papacy and every pope in succession who sat on the seat of authority in the Vatican, every pope in succession from the first to the last is the Antichrist of Scripture, history, and prophecy. This is not a new concept. This is the ancient belief of Bible-believing Christians all throughout the Christian era. There's nothing new at all about what Yerk and I are talking about. This is the belief of Bible-believing Christians all the way back to the Thessalonians under Paul's ministry. The belief of the true church of Jesus Christ about who is the Antichrist has never changed. It's only our generation and a generation preceding us uh, really coming to life in the early 1800s that ever heard of futurism. No one had ever heard of a future fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. No one had ever heard of a future Antichrist. They always talked about the Antichrist of their day all throughout the Christian era. And we're proving that. That's why we're here. We're proving this with documentation that you cannot refute. And so there's many of them that appreciate Yerk and I and believe that the papacy is, uh, you know, really bad stuff. But they're not on board with us, believing that uh, every pope in succession is the man of sin of Scripture, history, and prophecy. They're still stuck in their futurist indoctrination, which says the Antichrist is a single man that fulfills all the prophecies of Antichrist in the time span of one human lifespan, and it's simply untenable. It makes no sense whatsoever, and especially no common sense. There's no single man ever in the history of the world <laughs> that could have fulfilled all the prophecies of the Antichrist copied, uh, uh, printed in the Bible. It's virtually impossible. So we're left with only one choice. You've ever heard of a multiple choice question in a test or something? You usually have at least two selections to choose from, and in many cases, four choices to choose from. Well, in this case, you have but one choice to choose from. There is no other possibility. And that's the kind of care that you would expect from a loving Heavenly Father who gave His only begotten Son to redeem us from this man of sin, this son of perdition, and to teach us the right way to go. And He identified this man of sin with the Apostle Paul, with the prophet Daniel, with the prophet John the Revelator, and all. They all knew who this man of sin would be. And Paul describes him. Daniel describes him. John describes him. And you can't get it wrong. There's only one choice. And that's exactly what you would expect from a merciful, loving God to make sure we couldn't get it wrong. God wouldn't want us to have two choices. Who's the Messiah? Uh, Messiah A or Messiah B, or in some cases, my Messiah C or Messiah D. No, there's but one, and it's Jesus Christ. And just as important as it is to know that Jesus is the Christ and the only choice, he is equally diligent to see to it 
that we are not mistaken about who the Antichrist is. It's just that important. And you can't get it wrong. It's the papacy. And we're confident that this is true. And this is what was believed by all the saints throughout the Christian era. And we're proving it. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, the God of creation Elohim is not the God of delusion or deception. That is somebody else. Uh, we know who that is. Uh, that is the adversary. That is Satan. But, okay, I think this was a very necessary, uh, even though long, but necessary inauguration. Now let's go back to the little tablet we have. During the information, we are saying, and the first man who pops up during the Reformation is the one we already saw in this picture here, uh, that I put along here, Martin Luther, who stated uh, on August 18th and 1520, we hear of the conviction that the papacy is the seat of the true and real Antichrist. Um, August 18th, 1520, that's about the time when he wrote uh, uh, to the German nobility, um, that's uh, when he did some other working, some other notes, and I think uh, a year or so after that he uh, received his excommunication bull from the Pope, Exorge Domini, when the Pope excommunicated him, and uh, I think that was in 1521 somewhere, and Martin Luther managed to live until 1546, 25 years he lived under excommunication. He lived under the ban of the church. He was an outlaw. Everybody on site was allowed to kill him and even do a meritorious work to God. And they didn't, at least not for those 25 years. I don't know the exact circumstances of his death in 1546. It's just interesting that it is a few months after the starting of the Council of Trent that he deceased. But this is a very famous um, quote of him. We hear are of the conviction that the papacy is the seat of the true and real Antichrist. Here, can, I, can I interject something here? Yeah, sure. I just want the listeners to remember that we've already covered uh, many, many names that went back centuries prior to Martin Luther. Yeah, Martin the ones Luther, before the Reformation. I, I yes. said that, yeah. Yes, yes. And Martin Luther yeah. was a Roman Catholic. And now he is agreeing with all the Protestants that lived and breathed and moved and had their being all the way back to the first century church. Martin Luther came out of the delusion of the Roman Catholic Church. He once regarded the papacy as the Holy Father, the Vicar of Christ, but now even he has had his eyes opened a merciful savior opened his eyes to the reality that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. And now he's in agreement with all the saints throughout history, all the way back to the first century church under the Thessalonian, uh, under, the, under the leadership of Paul in Thessalonica. And so we're talking about those who, who were Roman Catholics, the reformers, were called reformers because they wanted to reform the Roman Catholic Church. They wanted to kick the papacy out. Okay? They wanted to make the Roman Catholic Church the Church of Jesus Christ, not the Church of Antichrist. And that's why they called themselves reformers. But sad to say, the Bible doesn't allow that to be a possibility. This church is irreformable. And it took a long time for the reformers to come to this realization. And instead of calling themselves reformers, they now call themselves protesters, Protestants. And they protested the Roman Catholic Church. They protested the sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church. All the lying wonders, all the mystical baloney of the Roman Catholic Church, all the unscriptural teachings, all the false doctrines, all the false miracles. The, all, they denounced the, the, the papacy as the Antichrist and the nuns as just whores for the priests. And they, they, did, they, they exposed the Roman Catholic Church and all of its criminality. 
and they enjoyed the mercy of God. But these are newcomers to the truth, these Protestant reformers. Every, every one of them were Roman Catholics. And they were mercifully saved by the merciful God of glory and brought out of the Roman Catholic Church. God literally reached into the bowels of the beast to extract these Protestant reformers. But they're latecomers to the truth. The truth was known all the way back to the first century. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, what you said that, Tom, about um, that God in his grace uh, took them out of the belly of the beast, uh, the one in the reforming time is true, but that's also true for the one uh, for the ones we spoke about in the last sessions, because all those, even though before the quote-unquote time of the Reformation, like Savonarola, like John Huss, like Matthias of Giano, John Wycliffe, and all those, they also were servants of the Roman Church in the first place, because there was no other church. Yeah. Um, and they had uh, then more or less access to uh, Bibles or whatever, and like Wycliffe, uh, even then translated them into English. Um, yes. uh, Savonarola too. He was he was a Roman Catholic. We saw that, and, and of course everybody can go back uh, to the last videos where the uh, where the link of Savonarola is on Wikipedia with the uh, description, and you see that God has been grateful to many many people throughout the centuries to pull them out of the Roman Catholic Church and to use them for His purposes. And right. His purposes is of course bringing the word out, and and that exactly is what. Um, what is said in Second Thessalonians 2, um, that the papacy will rule until um, Jesus Christ comes back and he will, uh, let, I, I just, I just want to yeah, yeah. uh, make sure that I will use the right destroy words. destroy them with the, with the yeah, spirit of his with mouth. With the spirit the of his mouth, of his yeah, body. exactly. But yeah, yes. let me just open this up here. I want to yeah. read it. I want to read it in Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Um because it's, it's very important to understand that when it says, um, um, and then shall the spirit be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. Now, the spirit of his mouth is, if you ask me. That's the Bible. The scripture. Bible. So yep. the time that we are talking about here, uh, we are going to talk about here, the time of the Reformation, when yep. people like Martin Luther translated the word of God into the common language yep. and gave the common man the possibility for the first in their time in their lives to read and understand the word of God, that is when the Lord consumed with the spirit of his mouth the Antichrist and then shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. That is still future today. Yep. So we see this is in, in, in verse 8. This is packed in two time frames. That wicked shall be revealed. That is already done now. We know that. That is the morphing, as Tom called it, from the pagan Roman Empire into the papal or quote-unquote holy Roman Empire we have today. Yep. And then that wicked shall be consumed with the spirit of his mouth, means the word that is all of a sudden made accessible to the people, who did yep. not have the Bible before, and in yep. the end he shall be destroyed with the brightness of his coming, the stone not cut out with hands that will smash into the feet of the statue of the four kingdoms, the man yep. kingdoms here on earth, and will erect a fifth kingdom uh, that will never end, the kingdom right. of Jesus Christ, if you allow me to say that. Praise the Lord, yep. Uh, another point, Martin Luther said the Antichrist is the papacy, the abomination of desolation is the papacy, the little horn is the papacy, the man of sin is the papacy. He said in Revelation ch ch chapter 13, the second beast is the papacy. Uh, listen, and he didn't say the first beast, he said the second beast. Revelation 17, the harlot and Babylon all applies to the papacy. Martin Luther was a man who lived in the beginning of the 16th century, and it is a um, common belief, it is not historically proven, that he nailed his 95 Theses to the church door. 
What is historically proven is that he published them in written in Latin on Reformation Day, as we call it today, 31st of October uh, 1517, that he published these in Latin, spread them around, and because they were so interesting, the people wanted to have them more, and they were translated into German, and then these papers were uh, distributed to all the people, even in the German language, and maybe uh, they have been nailed to the church door in Wittenberg. That is something that we historically do not know. And, you know, we, we stay here also, or we stand here also for our of the truth. I don't want to say anything that is not historically proven. It is historically proven that he published the 95 Thesis on the 31st of October in 1517. Absolutely. But it is not historically proven that he nailed them to the church door. That may be a myth, that may not be a myth. I don't care. The important point is the 95 points of his thesis were published and made accessible to the people. And when translated into German, the people all of a sudden understood that the whole indulgence selling was a scam. And Rome lived of that scam and very, very ritual. And Tom can go hours into that because he read and studied the wonderful book by Avro Manhattan, The Vatican Billions, that goes in uh, some heavy pages on that subject of the indulgences and the richness the Roman Catholic Church, Church got from that. But that's not our subject for today. But as you remember from last time, I put up a Wikipedia page of the uh, reformers we spoke about, and in this case speaking about Martin Luther. I just wanted to say um, Martin Luther translated the Bible in uh, 1520, that was about the time um, when he made this uh, famous quote, yeah, we here are of the conviction that the papacy is the seat of the true and real Antichrist, 1520 is the time of the publication of his paper uh, 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 against the German nobility, uh, or for the German nobility, where he put the German nobility, the noble people, you can say, yeah, the, the, the quote-unquote lords of Germany, the kings and princes and barons and, 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 and whatever titles they had, uh, into the knowledge that the papacy is the Antichrist. And the same year he wrote this wonderful book uh, of the Babylonian captivity of the church, uh, something that Tom years and years ago on First Amendment Radio read and discussed very profoundly. I think it is very interesting. And another thing that Martin Luther wrote that was in 1545, that was uh, shortly before his uh, decease, um, on the same day, believe it or not, as far as I researched it, this is absolutely true, on the same day that the Council of Trent was opened, Martin Luther published his work um, on um, what is it, the papacy and institution of the devil. That book came out. And not shortly after that, he deceased. So to me, yeah, you know, I'm always suspicious of the Jesuits, but I don't want to be a conspiracy theorist and say the Jesuits killed Martin Luther. But it seems to me quite, um, yeah, 18th of February 1546, you can see he died here. It seems to me quite possible um, that he maybe was um, poisoned, like so many other people. We don't know that much about him, but he was only 62 years old, which is not that old. People got older in that time, too. Uh, another point, if if you say, but yeah, you know, Jörg, in those times, people didn't get as old as they did now, uh, because the average age was so much lower than it is today. Yeah, that's right. The average age was so much lower. But, you know, uh, Bill Gates read a very important book um, that is called How to Lie with Statistics. <laughs> you have to know how to twist the truth. Um, the point is that in those times, in the 16th century, in the 15th century, uh, the children died many, many more when they were young. Many, many children didn't even see the age of five, six, seven, eight, nine, or 10 years old. And then, of course, when you have many children dying that young and not so many people dying at 70 or 80 or 85, of course, the average age is going down. So that's why they tell you that people didn't get that old. But, you know, the Bible says that before the flood, many people got even before uh, over 900 years. So it's all a lie. And I just think 62 years is quite young. 
and he could have lived a little bit longer. I would have loved to see it a little bit longer because, you know, Tom, when we read this book of Martin Luther, I mean, I read it on my time and my channel, you read it on your time and your channel in the time, uh, the, 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 the papacy and institution of the devil. In the end of that book, he says, if God grants me a few more years, I will do another book of this. <laughs> I was so much actually looking forward to see that, but of course, knowing that he didn't live long enough uh, to have that. So Martin Luther, yeah, started as a monastic life. He was an Augustinian monk. Um, and then he came by quote unquote accident to the knowledge of the Bible. And all of a sudden uh, he understood that uh, you are saved by grace and not by works. Uh, here is this uh, paper of 1520 that I just said to the Christian nobility of the German nation and the other one of the Babylonian captivity of the church, both published in 1520, uh, what I'm saying here. Then, of course, he had a breach with the papacy and then he was excommunicated with the bull Exergi Domini, just as I said, on the 15th of June 1520 already. Oh, I, I thought that was a year later. And then, of course, on August the 18th, after receiving that bull, he said, yeah, we are here of the conviction that the papacy is the seat of the true and real Antichrist. Uh, you, of course, have the famous Diet of Worms, where he uh, famously, uh, it is said, stood and said, uh, if you cannot convict me, by, uh, uh, unless I'm convinced by the testimony of scriptures or by clear reason, for I do not I trust either in the Pope or in councils alone, since they, it is well known that they have often erred and contradicted themselves. I am bound by the scriptures I have quoted, and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything, since it is neither safe or right to go against conscience. May God help me. Amen. That is he supposed to have said. I don't think if there's any true historical record for that, but uh, if he didn't say that, I can live with those words. Then after these, he was taken uh, captive by a friend into the Wartburg in Germany uh, so that the papists couldn't get to him and kill him. And in that captivity, he wrote uh, or he translated the Bible into German, first the New Testament and then later the Old Testament. And it is said, by the way, that the first book of the Old Testament he translated, I don't have proof of that, it's just what I read somewhere, um, that the first book of the Old Testament he translated into German was, by the way, the book of Daniel. <laughs> oh, how oh, come? You think. Yeah, he was disguised in the Wartburg as Junker Jörg, which is quite interesting because Jörg is my name also. So you see a little connection there. Uh, later on, he married, and uh, he, he is the first one, by the way, who put out a book uh, of a catechism. And then later on, the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, copied his catechism. The, catech the catechism the Roman Catholic Church has is only because Martin Luther came out with a catechism. First, they copycatted him, you can say. Yeah, then he translated the Bible. He was a Hinduist, that means he wrote some songs. Uh, Unser Gott ist eine feste Burg is a wonderful song that you can listen to. Um, and of course, he still had some Roman Catholic leaven in him. Uh, he still uh, prayed the rosary. He venerated Mary. He was in favor of child baptism. Uh, so he was not... Uh, 100% uh, biblical in his teaching. It's just because, as what uh, Tom says so very often, it is easier to get a man out of Catholicism than to get Catholicism out of a man. And even Martin Luther is proof to that fact. Anyway, uh, he was a man who lived by the grace of God long enough to give the German people a, la a Bible in their own language and with that freed the people with the truth that only Jesus Christ can give. And um, that is what is written in the Bible. He, Jesus Christ says, my peace I give you, not the peace of this world, but my peace I give you. And uh, the truth will set you free. And I am the way, the truth, and the life. So this Jesus Christ was given to the German people. And many people in Europe understood German in the time and were glad to hold the German Bible and 
with the first German Bible, many other Bibles were translated in their own language. For example, you had uh, translations, of course, as we know from the beginning, John Wycliffe did that before, uh, Tyndale also in a contemporary of Martin Luther translated the Bible, and those were basis text even later then used for the King James Version that we hold so dearly today, the 1611 King James Version. Um, and from those Bibles, many Bibles were translated into their language. You have the uh, Reina Valera, I think it is called, something in, in Spanish. You have an Italian Bible, a Bible in Italian, based on the Masoretic text in the Old Testament, the original Hebrew and Aramaic texts, and uh, the Koine Greek in the New Testament. You have that in Italian, you have that in Spanish, you have that, of course, in English and in German. Uh, and you have that in many other languages, also in Dutch, for example, in 1618, uh, seven years after the 1611 Bible, the Statenvertaling came out, and uh, that is a translation um, very similar to the King James in Dutch. And uh, the Dutch people were also a very... Um, uh, people going into the world, you know, conquering, like going to South Africa and all that stuff. So even Dutch was spoken in many places in that time. And all those people, all of a sudden, by the grace of God, held the word of God in their own language in their hand. And they could see for themselves that the Antichrist is the papacy. And, of course, that led to some revolution here and there. In Germany, there started farmer wars and uh, everywhere else. And, of course, Martin Luther then was charged with the... Um, responsibility of uh, the farmers going into war and bloodshedding and all that stuff where you know I don't want to judge that I think that is on God to do but um, I just think um, that many people took the truth of the Bible a little bit wrong as they do today many people just can't handle the truth they can deal with the truth um, and they cannot deal with the spiritual truth and that's why they very often take it just uh, physical, fleshly. Yeah? And um, that's not the way the Bible is to be understood in many, many parts. Of course, there are many parts that yeah, the Bible is un to, to be understood directly, but there's also many parts where the Bible is to be understood spiritually. It's a spiritual book. Anyway, this is all that I wanted to say about Martin Luther. I don't know, Tom, if you have anything else to add on that. Oh, we, we've already gone on plenty long with Martin Luther, but I, I would conclude with this. What is, is most important for the listeners to understand is that church that bears Martin Luther's name, the Lutheran church, the namesake of Martin Luther is the Lutheran church and is supposed to be built on Lutheran foundations, that Jesus is the Christ and the papacy is the Antichrist. That church called Lutheran, Martin Luther's church, has been the leader in the ecumenical movement to unite all the Protestant evangelical churches back under the, under the authority of the man of sin in Rome, the Roman Catholic pontiff. Mm. The Lutheran church of all the Protestant, the apostate Protestant and evangelical churches has been the leader to the Pied Pipers of the return to the Roman Catholic church and, and papal authority. They are enslaving us all to the man of sin, the son of perdition, the biblical, historical, and prophetic antichrist. It's the Protestant and evangelical churches that have betrayed Christ. They have betrayed Bible-believing Christians, Jesus Christ-loving Christians, and are putting them under the authority of the man of sin. And the governments of the world are following suit. Okay, they're using the governments of the world to, to, to uh, enslave us back under papal authority. And if Martin Luther were here today and could see what his church is doing, I'll just leave it to your imagination what he would do and what he would say. That's interesting, the wording that you used, Tom. It's about, uh, let's say, the church that led many people out of the Roman Catholic Church in the first place, the first one, the Lutheran, is the first one to lead them all back also. That's right. The That's Pied what Piper. Rome would have us all believe anyway. Yeah, yeah, of course. But, you know, the Lutheran Church was founded uh, not by Luther himself. That was something later on. But that's another point. But you, you, make a very, you, know, you make a very interesting point there, of course. 
that the same who let us out of the deception is going to lead us back into the deception. And one of the proving points that we have, and for everybody to check on black on white, written in on paper, but <laughs> I would almost say almost hoon and stone, the Roman Catholic Church would love it to, to uh, slay that in stone, uh, is the Joint Declaration of Justification, the Lutheran Worldwide um, Federation, signed on the 31st of October of all dates, 1999 with the Roman Catholic Church and Tom and I did I think five broadcasts on that when you go to the playlist Hour of the Truth the first five videos are all uh, explaining that wonderful paper that Richard Bennett in the time put together and we are working ourselves through that joint declaration of justification where the Roman Catholic Church uh, the, the, the Lutheran Church capitulates to the Roman Catholic Church. And when that stone fell, it's a question of domino playing since all the others fell. And uh, today I don't think that you see many churches that are not ecumenical, that are not organized in the World Council of Churches, that are not following Rome's dogma of Vatican II. From 1962 and the, to 61. And, the re, and the reason why they're going back to the Roman Catholic Church is because they believe in futurism. Yeah. They That's believe it. now in futurism that the Antichrist is a figment of the future. It's not the historical papacy. And what they're doing is saying that the Protestant Reformation was a mistake, that they were wrong that Martin Luther was wrong when he said the papacy is the man of sin, that all the Protestant reformers were wrong when they identified the papacy as the antichrist of scripture, history, and prophecy. <clears throat> and now they're all about making reparations to the Roman Catholic Church. They're coming back to the Roman Catholic Church, and they're going to round up the rest of us and force us into Roman Catholics uh, force us into Roman Catholicism through civil legislation, okay? And and the Bible tells you that there will come a time when you won't be able to buy or sell, you won't be able to participate in commerce, you won't be able to hold a job, you won't be able to travel, you won't be able to do anything unless you concede to the papal antichrist. That's what's coming. And that's what your pastors are hiding from you. That's why we're doing these broadcasts. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, now you just caught me sipping from my water. <laughs> okay. Enough on Martin Luther. We are almost come to the end of our broadcast today. We still have 10 minutes. So the second person that we are addressing today in this list during the Reformation is Philip Melanchthon who lived in 1543, of course, a little bit before and a little bit after. We are just going directly into his Wikipedia page. He identified the Antichrist as the papacy. He identified the man of sin as being the papacy, and he identified Revelation chapter 17, the whore of Babylon, as the papacy. Now, who was Philip Melanchthon? Let us just see that we open his link in Wikipedia. He was born in 1497 and uh, died on 19th of April 1560. A German Lutheran reformer, so he was a follower of Luther. He was a collaborator with Martin Luther, the first systematic theologian of the Protestant Reformation. He was an intellectual leader of the Lutheran Reformation and an influential designer of educational systems. He stands next to Luther and John Calvin as a reformer, theologian, and molder of Protestantism. And let's not forget, what are we protesting? The papacy. The Antichrist. We are protesting that the Roman Catholic Church, the church who claims that outside of her there is no salvation, that that church hoards the Antichrist, that that church is the synagogue of Satan. Now you can leave about, uh, read about that he even was a professor at Wittenberg at the time when uh, Martin Luther was there too. Uh, you can read about his uh, wonderful work in the Augsburg Confession uh, at the Diet of Augsburg in 1530. That was when the Protestants uh, went to the emperor and wanted to have their 
religious freedom that was not really granted them. And uh, the thing that I always hold against Melanchthon is that at that time he should have there stood like Martin Luther in 1520 and tell them that the papacy is the Antichrist. Something he didn't do, um, but anyway, that's something to study for yourself. Yet disputes with Osiander, and that's some, way, some guy who we will meet later in that, in that list on. Um, it's an interesting article to read, as many articles of uh, people like these are interesting to read. But uh, never forget, this is Wikipedia. A Wikipedia is actually a page from the Antichrist. It never tells you everything and it never tells you everything that is really true. You have to have more sources. But to get a first impression on who Melanchthon was, it is surely not wrong to turn to Wikipedia to inform yourself a little bit about him. Now, after Philip Melanchthon, we have Andreas Osiander. I just said it. he was in the article of um, uh, Melanchthon that we just read. Huh? Uh, I, I mentioned Osiander here, you know. Now let's go into who is Osiander himself. Let's go see if we can go from here. Uh, Osiander, or otherwise, uh, Alexander Osiander. Here we have him. Then I don't have to open the other link, but this is the same Wikipedia link. Andreas Osiander uh, lived from 1498 until 1552, a German Lutheran theologian and also a Protestant reformer was born in Ansbach in the uh, region of Franconia. He studied at the University of Ingolstadt. That is one of the most famous Jesuit universities. But of course, in the time that he studied there, the Jesuits didn't even exist. Okay, But that University of Ingolstadt is where uh, uh, Adam Weishaupt came from, founded the Illuminati there. Uh, it's that university that has a long, rich history. It was founded in 1472. So when he was born in 1498, that means that he was one of uh, studying there within the first 30, 35 years of the foundation of that university in Ingolstadt. Um, his theology was, he was a Christian mystic, and his theology incorporated the idea of mystical union uh, with Christ and the Word of God. Well, those articles, is that, that's why I always say take Wikipedia with a big grain of salt, because there is no such thing as a Christian mystic. You are either a mystic or you are a Christian. You cannot be both. It's an oxymoron. But, of course, Wikipedia is the way that teaches that. Anyway, he was a reformer and he said, the Antichrist is the papacy. The abomination of desolation are the papal traditions. The little horn, the man of sin, Revelation chapter 13, beast number 1, Revelation chapter 17, the harlot beast, and Babylon all applies to the papacy. That is what Andreas Osiander thought and taught. If you have any comments, Tom, I hear it, okay? Otherwise, I, just I, would want just... To, I, just, I just want to remind the listeners that this is the short list. Yeah, this is the this short is, list. This is the short list, believe it or not. And uh, you couldn't name all of those throughout history who have believed with all their heart that the man of sin, the son of perdition, the antichrist of scripture, history, and prophecy was none other than the papacy. Yeah, I said that also in the beginning, I think, yeah. Tom, that I said that we cannot know them all, but those are just <clears throat> the ones that are quote-unquote famous and put on Wikipedia and whatever. Let's just put it, let's just put it this way. The list is so long that God can't even recite them all. He calls them the, the, the martyrs of Jesus. He calls them, in the scripture, he calls them the martyrs of Jesus. And let me tell you, they are hundreds of millions throughout the centuries who have been martyred at the hands of the papacy and the governments of the rule of the governments of the world that served him. If, if we were to understand any concept at all about how much blood was shed by the saints of Jesus for claiming that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist, we would swoon 
And we'll never know until, until, until Christ returns and rewinds the tape and we can see every drop of blood that's been shed against the saints of Almighty God. Jesus knew what he was saying when he said that when they, you see they persecute me, know that they will persecute you. And they have been persecuted, the saints of Almighty God. And Scripture tells us what has become a reality, that the righteous perish and no one takes it to heart. Because you can go all over this country, you can go all over this world into Protestant and evangelical churches and ask them who the martyrs of Jesus are and why they were martyred, they can't tell you. But you can tell them. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. I very much valid your comments every time. Now let's go to Nikolaus von Amsdorf before we close it down for today, because it has already been an hour. Nikolaus von Amsdorf lived in the time of 1545. He identified the Antichrist as being the papacy. He also said that the abomination of desolation are papal traditions, just as Andreas Osiander and Martin Luther said. He also identified the first beast of Revelation 13 as the papacy, Revelation 17, the harlot, and Revelation 17, Babylon, as the Antichrist. Now, Nicholas von Amstorff, I have a link about him somewhere, uh, during, von Amstorff here, it is. He lived between 1483, that is the same year Martin Luther was born, and the 5th of May 1565, German Lutheran theologian and early Protestant reformer. A bishop of Naumburg, he became the first Lutheran bishop in the Holy Roman Empire. So he became the first Lutheran Protestant bishop in the quote-unquote Holy Roman Empire, in the Catholic Empire. He was born in Torgau at the Elbe, which is a river also Hamburg uh, lies where, where I come from. Like Andreas Karlstadt, who was also contemporary of Martin Luther, he was at first a leading exponent of the older type of scholastic theology, but under the influence of Luther abandoned his Aristotelian positions for a theology based on the Augustinian doctrine of grace. Throughout his life he remained one of Luther's most determined supporters. He was with him at the Leipzig Conference in 1519. He was with him at the Diet of Worms in 1521 and was privy to the secret of his Wartburg seclusion. He assisted the first efforts of the Reformation at Magdeburg, at Goslar and Einbeck, took an active part in the debates at Schmalkalden, you know where the Schmalkalden articles come from, where he defended the use of the sacrament by the unbelieving and spoke out strongly against the bigamy of the landgraves of Hesse. After the death of Philip of the Palatinate, the Bishop of Naumburg Seitz, he was installed here on the 20th of January 1542, though in opposition to the chapter by the Prince Elector of Saxony and Luther. His position was a painful one and he longed to get back to Magdeburg, but was persuaded by Luther to stay. After Luther's death in 1546 and the Battle of Mühlberg in 1547, this is uh, of the um, farmer wars that I spoke of, he had to yield his rival Julius von Pflug and retire to the protection of the young Duke of Weimar. Here he took part in founding of the Jena University in 1558, opposed the Augsburg Interim, superintended the publication of the Jena edition of Luther's work and debated on the freedom of the will, original sin, and more noticeably on the Christian value of good works, in regard to which he held that they were not useless, but prejudicial the matters of man's, in the matter of man's salvation. He urged the separation of the High Lutheran Party from Melanchthon, got the Saxons Duke to oppose the Frankfurt Recess and continued to fight for the purity of Lutheran doctrine. Well, I continue to fight for Bible doctrine. I don't follow any man, neither Luther, nor Calvin, nor Amstorf, nor Karlstadt, nor whatever name. I just follow the Bible. 
I don't want to follow any man because, as Tom so famously says every time, uh, when a man opens his mouth, he's, li he's lying. And I want to have the truth. That's why I follow the Bible. That's why I read the 1611 King James Bible. And that's why I'm very much looking forward to next week when Tom and I come together for the next part. And it's going to be a long one. Yeah, but we have so much to say and you have so much to learn when we want to introduce these wonderful Protestant reformers to you. That's why we continue next week and I leave the closing remarks of this broadcast to Tom. Thank you very much. And Tom, please. It's I want to close by just uh, asking the listeners a question. Surely by now you understand the value of this information and how critically important it is to your, to your understanding. How critically important it is, especially to your choice in what you will believe, either futurism, the lie that is taught in all the churches, or historicism, the truth that is believed by the vast majority of Christians throughout the Christian era. The question is, why is not your pastor teaching you these things? That is the question. I'm always going to come back to this question. This is a question that begs to be answered by every Christian in, that hears me. Why is not your pastor teaching you these things? Is it not his responsibility? And if not, whose responsibility is it? That's where I'll leave it. See you next week. Suffering at the hands of Rome Cause they believed in Christ alone They died through Europe, especially Spain For they saw all but Christ in vain He suffered by His death for men To save them from their awful sin Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase With iron heel and iron hand The Roman Pope ruled the land Those ignorant of history May be swept into apostasy We won't be loved by Rome, sweet lie With fifty million reasons why Salvation is by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. A sovereign God give faith to man. Salvation's in the Maker's hand. This gospel offends Rome today. They offer up another way, a counterfeit. A compromise, beware the ancient papal lie With such a cloud of witnesses Who by grace died in their Lord Recall their memory to say By the same faith we live today